In the days of the Old West, New Mexico was home, at one time or another, to many of the more colorful desperados. The Clantons, William Bonney, Jesse Evans, William Curly Bill Brocious, Clay Allison, Doroteo El Tigre Sains, Tom Blackjack Ketchum, John King of the Rustlers Kinney, Jim Miller, and Johnny Ringo are a relatively small sample. Because of its remoteness and proximity to the Mexican border, southern New Mexico attracted a large number of outlaws, violent men who lived from the labor of others, who were quick to kill, and for whom the conventions of settled society meant little. A man who fit the mold of New Mexican outlaw and has been largely ignored by historians and folklorists was Jose Chavez E. Chavez. Born in 1851 in Ceboleta, New Mexico, little is known of his childhood. Jose discovered that honest labor is often difficult, and he gradually drifted from petty theft to cattle rustling. By the time of the Lincoln County War, Jose was in the company of William Bonney and his following of thieves and rustlers. During the Lincoln County War, Jose sided with the Tunstall McSween faction against the House, as the Dolan faction was popularly known. The formation by McSween of the Regulators, a personal army under a thin cloak of legality, made up of between 40 and 50 hard cases paid $4 a day by Tunstall, turned the sniping of the two Lincoln County factions into open warfare. Among the Regulators were Jose, Billy the Kid, Charlie Baudre, Jim French, John Middleton, and Fred Waite. Special Constable Dick Brewer led them. The murder of John Tunstall on February 28, 1878 by members of the Dolan faction led on April 1st to the assassination of Sheriff Brady and Lincoln by Bonnie and several others. In later years, Chavez y Chavez claimed the killing of Brady to have been his own work. More deaths followed, and a climax of sorts was reached with the big killing of July 19th. McSween, his wife, and their dozen or so allies had barricaded themselves in McSween's home. The house was set afire, and in the chaos that followed McSween and five of his allies died. Jose and four others, among them Billy the Kid, fled the burning structure, all save one making it safely to the shelter of the riverbanks behind the burning house. Harvey Morris died in a hail of gunfire before he had gone three steps into the yard. In an attempt to stop the chaos, in March 1879, Governor Lew Wallace established a militia of 50 men called the Lincoln County Mounted Rifles. Chavez I. Chavez enlisted as a private. The purpose of the militia was to curtail rustling and its accompanying violence, and to bring to justice men for whom warrants had been issued. The group was disbanded the following July, having done little to bring stability to the turbulent area. In the meantime, Jose had testified at the Dudley Court of Inquiry along with Billy the Kid, in a vain attempt to secure some accountability for the Army's role in the big killing. In May 1880, a prisoner in the Lincoln County Jail, one-eyed Joe Murphy, was assassinated, and it was widely held that Chavez I. Chavez was responsible. After his friend Billy the Kid was killed by Pat Garrett at Fort Sumner on July 14, 1881, Jose began to drift, always on the fringe of the law, doing what was necessary to survive. He moved north and turned up at Las Vegas, New Mexico, where his reputation with a gun reputedly led to a contest with Bob Ford, assassin of Jesse James. Jose's skill won a shooting match convincingly, the story goes, and when subsequently challenged to a duel, the humiliated Ford fled. The story, apocryphal or not, may have led to a job as a lawman, because Jose became one of three policemen in Old Town, Las Vegas. Unwilling to escape his past, he joined Vincente Silvis's gang, La Sociedad de Bandidos, and Las Goras Blancas, the terrorist arm of El Partido del Pueblo Unido. The White Caps, a clan-like organization, sought through fence-cutting, arson, and physical assault to drive settlers from lands that had once been common pasture. The Society of Bandits was a mafia-like collection of some of the meanest, cruelest men ever assembled in New Mexico. Chavez y Chavez felt right at home. On October 22, 1892, Jose and two other Old Town police officers, Eugenio Alarid and Julian Trujillo, lynched one Patricio Mayas at the behest of Vincente Silva. In February 1893, Silva, fearing his brother-in-law, Gabriel Sandoval, was privy to the truth about Mayas and was about to inform, murdered Gabriel with the assistance of Chavez y Chavez, Alarid, and Trujillo. Silva became concerned over his wife's constant questions about her brother's disappearance and decided she had to be killed. He ordered his trusty trio to dig a grave for his wife's body, and while they dug, they decided that Silva was out of control. When Silva appeared with his wife's body, the trio murdered him and buried the two together. 
The following year, a man arrested for the Mayas murder implicated Jose Eugenio and Trujillo in the murder of Sandoval. In April 1894, Eugenio and Trujillo were arrested, tried, and sentenced to life imprisonment. Chavez y Chavez, with a dollar five hundred price on his head, fled and was arrested May 26, 1894 at Socorro. He was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death, but was given a new trial by the Territorial Supreme Court. Found guilty again, he was sentenced to be hanged October 29, 1897. He was granted a stay of execution, and on November 20th, Governor Otero, over prolonged and vociferous objections from the citizens of Las Vegas, commuted the death sentence to life in prison. On November 23, 1897, Chavez I. Chavez entered the territorial penitentiary as inmate number 1089, there to remain until January 11, 1909, when, at the age of 57, Governor George Curry pardoned him. The pardon was the result of assistance Jose had rendered to guards during a riot. He returned to Las Vegas and spent his remaining years among his friends. Unlike so many of his contemporaries, his passing was a peaceful one. A feared pistolero, killer of more men than Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett combined, Jose died in bed holding the hand of Liberato Baca, who was possibly the only man to face Jose in a gunfight and live to tell about it. The hombre muy malo was 72. There's a curious footnote to Jose's story. He has been linked by a number of writers to the February 1st, 1896 murder of Colonel Albert Jennings Fountain and his son, despite the fact that he was behind bars at the time the murders took place. In his autobiography, George Curry asserted that Jose was implicated in the murders, and that assertion has been accepted uncritically until recently. The deaths of Albert and Henry Fountain cannot be counted among Jose's many killings. As the years passed, the memory of Jose Chavez y Chavez began to fade into the annals of history. The once feared pistolero had lived a life filled with violence and lawlessness, but now he sought redemption in the twilight of his years. With his release from prison, he returned to Las Vegas, a changed man determined to leave his past behind. The townsfolk, however, were not quick to forget the dark chapters of his past. Whispers of his misdeeds still echoed through the streets, and some found it hard to believe that a man so steeped in bloodshed could truly change. Yet Jose's actions in prison had earned him some respect, and a few were willing to give him a second chance. Among those willing to offer forgiveness was Liberato Baca, the man who had once faced Jose in a legendary gunfight. Despite their violent past, the two men had developed an unexpected bond during Jose's time in prison. It was Liberato who stood by Jose's side as he faced the challenges of reintegration into society. Slowly, Jose began to rebuild his life. He found work as a ranch hand, using the skills he had honed as a cattle rustler for a more honest living. The open plains of New Mexico provided a peaceful contrast to the tumultuous days of his youth. He sought solace in the quiet routine of ranch life, and as the years passed, the town started to see a different side of the man they had once feared. Jose's transformation was not without its setbacks, though. The ghosts of his past continued to haunt him, and there were those who refused to let him forget the blood he had spilled. But Jose remained resolute, determined to prove that a man could change, that he could change. In the heart of Las Vegas, a community center was established to promote reconciliation and healing among the townspeople. It was a bold endeavor, given the dark history that had divided them for so long. But the center became a beacon of hope, a place where former adversaries could come together and learn from their shared past. Jose, with Liberato at his side, became an unexpected advocate for the center's mission. He shared his own story of redemption, urging others to see the possibility of change, even in the most hardened hearts. Gradually, the walls of distrust began to crumble, and the townsfolk started to see Jose not as a pistolero, but as a man who had walked a dark path and emerged into the light. As the years passed, Jose's health began to decline, and he knew that his time on earth was drawing to a close. With Liberato's support, he spent his final days speaking to the young, sharing his story of a life marked by violence and the pursuit of redemption. His message resonated deeply with those who listened, leaving an indelible mark on their souls. On a warm summer evening, surrounded by those who had come to know and respect him, Jose Chavez y Chavez passed away peacefully in his bed. The news of his passing spread through the town, and even those who had once harbored resentment found themselves mourning the loss of a man who had become an unlikely symbol of hope and change. In the years that followed, the community center continued to thrive, 
fostering understanding and unity among the people of Las Vegas. Jose's story lived on, inspiring generations to come. His tale served as a reminder that even in the darkest of times, redemption was possible, and that the most terrible of pasts could be transformed into a future of hope. It stands as a testament to the power of change and the strength of the human spirit. His legacy lives on, not as a feared pistolero, but as a man who once chose violence, but ultimately chose a different path. A path of redemption, forgiveness, and the belief in the possibility of change.